My God. Uh, it was devastating to learn that Melvin had AIDS, you know, especially at that time, because we all viewed it as a death sentence, you know, which it, it proved to be for him. When I visited him in the hospital and I said, Mel, what is it that I can do to you, do for you? Because it was, things were getting close. And he said, I want to talk to my listeners. I want to be able to say, tell them how much I care about them. Yeah. I mean, people are just, um, I mean, unrealistic crime pangs to show their love. And I really have appreciated it. Really, it turned out to be just days before he passed on. First of all, let me say good, good after late afternoon. Um, because of uh, the HIV virus that I have attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers uh, today. And I remember the day that um, Magic announced, like it was yesterday, I was at an entertainment lawyers conference and we were all stunned. Um, I think at that time I was aware um, that Melvin had AIDS, he told me. Um, and all I could do at that point was try to be supportive because he wasn't willing to come out publicly. He was at WKYS. Uh, he was also on television at BET. And he was undergoing treatment and now he had had AIDS for a couple of years at this point. And the uh, Kaposi's sarcoma was starting to show up on his face. It was, it was a real difficult time for Melvin. It was still a big shock when we realized and he came to us and told us he was sick. But we were just, just all there for him. Being on the radio, being on uh, television for a while, so he had to sort of watch the, the, uh, the crowd, you know, the people he socialized with. He kept it quiet. At that time, HIV, AIDS. People didn't know what that was, and you almost became a pariah. In addition, um, because of the stigma attached to AIDS, it wasn't something that he wanted to talk about. People were afraid of anyone with AIDS. You know, um, what would they feel? What would the next radio announcer feel coming after him using the same microphone? Um, so it was um, a very difficult thing. The understanding in Washington that we had an HIV problem came fairly quickly, but it didn't come to all parts of the city fairly quickly. You know, I moved to Washington in 1982, and by 1983, I knew five people who were dying. And, uh, and then the Washington Blade ran an article on Ray Engelbretson, um, who was one of the first public people dying of HIV in Washington, D.C. And in 1984, um, the Whitman Walker Clinic, along with GW, held a forum at Lisner Auditorium with Dr. Tony Fauci and giving an update um, on what was known at the time. The room was full. There were people sitting in every space that the building could hold. So in 1984, there was the fear, there was the just terror that something, you know, was coming. It wasn't quite here yet, but everyone knew it was coming. We had a very dynamic gay community here in DC, and a lot of people were flocking to DC to work for the federal government like I did. And, uh, but at the same time, we had this disease that was ravaging all our communities. And, um, you know, it was, um, even when I think about it today, it's just, it was a really challenging time because we were losing our friends. I think you'll read, you know, people were going to memorial services every week, every weekend. It's just a, a lot of death. 
dying, and we were young. I mean, this was 40, 35, 40 years ago. We were young people uh, dealing with HIV and AIDS in terms of HIV, which is what we're talking about, I think. Uh, there were a lot of gains made, uh, but not without struggle and not without protests, which is always very important. Today, uh, you know, we still need to continue, not, not give up because there, you know, we have PrEP now, you can take a pill and, you know, uh, but not everyone has access to PrEP and people are still getting infected with HIV. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's something that is a virus that's still here. We have, to, people have to keep, continue to protect themselves against it. I, we knew that, uh, and there was no, no medicines like there are now. He, he would go out, he went out to California and, and tried to get a, a cocktail. I'll never forget, there was a doctor in California and we often went out and we were all hoping and praying that this medicine would help. And I don't know whether it was, uh, you know, bare aspirin that he gave Melvin because you know, I was, Melvin and I were a lot of like, I guess, I had a big bouquet of flowers sent to the doctor. And when we realized that, uh, I canceled it. Canceled oh that delivery. God. When I realized Melvin came back and it wasn't getting any better. Yeah, but you know, during those times, medicine research just wasn't what it is today. His AIDS was becoming full blown he had decided that it would be best not to be working from seven to midnight. And there was an opening over at WPGC. He preferred to be early because he knew that these were his last days. In Melvin's last days, he called me over to his house and he said, you know, I just want to tell you everything that's going on because he didn't tell me that he had AIDS or HIV uh, until then. So I'm at his house. And he said, I just want to tell you what's really going on with me. Um, I'm gay. I started laughing. <laughs> I said, I know, who cares? I said, I've always loved you, it didn't matter. And he said, I always felt like if I wasn't gay, you would have been my wife. So I never could talk to you about that. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, we had such a chemistry and we would say, listen, if we don't get married to other people, we're gonna get married and have kids together. That was always our thing. It was, it was tough. My mom did, and my family in general, did a good job of not having us around Melvin, because in a lot of ways, they didn't want us to see how it was ravaging and it, he, he deteriorated. She didn't want, especially at a young age, that be the like lasting image of my uncle. She wanted us to remember, and my family in general wanted us to remember him as the person we knew him as. Um, you know, when we saw him on TV, as well as when we saw him in person. In the same breath, to see that at such an early age and the effects of something like HIV and AIDS, really, I mean, in a lot of ways, it kind of broke down the stigmas that when I would see people later in life, I was like, well, it hit home because like my uncle, that it happened to him and it happened to someone I knew and loved. Pam and I, my wife, went numerous times to visit him in the hospital and, uh, It, it, it was tough. It was really, really tough um, to see this beautiful, classy, young man um, deteriorating like that, you know, facing death was just, it was hard. It was really hard. Uh, but through, through all of that, he was still classy. He was still Melvin, you know, still first class. And I said, Melvin, you really gotta go public with this. And I'll tell you what, everyone loves you and they're still gonna love you. And let me set up an interview for you with the Washington Post. The article that was written was so fabulous. It was a two page style section. He was on the front cover of the style section and he went into everything about AIDS and what it meant. The upshoot of that article was he felt like people could, would love people who have AIDS. And he learned that as a result. When that article dropped, I mean, everyone called him. I think it extended his life. Board members of the community too have responded. 
I'm Flowers from Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, me is Kelly is called, and we talked, and when they do this tribute for me in May, she told me she'll definitely play a part in that program. Everyone came to Washington, D.C. for this big event to honor Melvin Lindsay that was also um, giving back to the community and raising money for AIDS. And Melvin was so excited. I mean, he, okay, invite so-and-so and so-and-so. And and I know it just really, really helped him. It gave him um, a lot to look forward to and it did extend his life. But unfortunately, he didn't make the event but we raised a lot of money. Um, And he really changed, you know, the outlook that people had, not only here in Washington, but I think nationally. I had apple pie, (laughs) uh, lasagna, uh, baked, uh, you know, brownies. I mean, people are just, um, I mean, unrealistic crime things to show their love. And I really have appreciated it. To be able to share that moment with him, to connect with the listeners that he loved so much, and really just to tell them how much he loved them. You know, I think it was encouraging for him because people called and and nobody had a a negative word. Everybody was encouraging. loving, there was laughter. Um, He talked openly about the disease that he was fighting. He talked openly about um, his family. He talked a lot about his family, a lot about how much he loved his family. The biggest thing that I noticed that after Melvin passed, my grandmother, he was the baby of the six kids uh, and, you know, my aunts and uncles. And after he was gone, my grandmother's health just deteriorated herself because I'm like, she lost her youngest kid. When I found out he passed away, I cried. It hurt. I still cry about it. And it still hurts. I miss him a lot. You know, we were co-hosting a show on national TV on BET screen scene together. So when he passed away, I had to do it every day by myself. And some of those days, I would just break out crying in the middle of it. I just couldn't, you know, accept it. He was just, you know, uh, not only a client, but a wonderful friend and human being.